but uh, let's get going on it anyway. Uh, the image in the New England Journal is this um, picture of a young person's colon. A baby boy born at 39 weeks gestation had bilious emesis, sounds like bowel obstruction, and a water-soluble contrast enema showed the following. And what we see here is um, uh, the colon looks like a pipe. As a matter of fact, this is actually an, a question mark. And the normal haustral markings aren't discernible. And it stretches from uh, the very end here of the rectum to uh, the descending colon and the transverse colon. And then things look a little better. And we're asked what this is. Well, necrotizing enterocolitis isn't all that likely. Uh, duodenal atresia, pyloric stenosis, congenital syphilis, and the only thing that makes sense here is uh, Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, that's a topic that we covered relatively recently. Uh, what this process involves is an aganglionic segment in the colon. Uh, that means that peristalsis cannot occur normally. And these children then have a colonic obstruction, and that's why they have bilious vomiting. So if we look at that, this is a, 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 a disease that has a genetic origin, and it's the distal colon that's primarily involved, although the proximal colon can be involved to substantially lesser degrees. So in terms of this um, um, imaging study that we just looked at that looks like a question mark, I would assume that a portion of the transverse colon, the descending colon, and rectum are involved. Uh, this condition goes along with Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis, brachydactyly for reasons that aren't clear to me, and Wilson's disease. Um, Shortly, recently, we looked at a New England Journal paper looking for new genetic variants responsible for Hirschsprung's disease. And in that discussion, there are some genes that are known, endothelin-3 and the endothelin receptor gene are involved, the ret gene. And in that paper that we reviewed several weeks ago, there were a number of new gene loci that are relevant to Hirschsprung's disease, just as a reminder. So this is a, a, a segment of agangliosis involving our box plexus. Pyloric stenosis is um, a stomach problem. These children have emesis, but it should not be bilious because the um, bile duct enters a small bowel at a more distal segment. Uh, this condition can be diagnosed easily with ultrasound and is treated surgically and um, a quick diagnosis is necessary. Uh, duodenal atresia uh, is a little further distal to the pylorus, obvious, obviously. Uh, diagnostic ultrasound is also helpful, but what's classic is the uh, appearance of a double bubble sign a dilated stomach and a dilated um, uh, area of uh, duodenum, uh, as shown in this classical uh, rentgenogram of a child with duodenal atresia. This is the double bubble sign, and you should know that. Now, the first topic of the New England Journal has to do with um, uh, the placement of cardiac implantable electronic devices, and if these pockets become infected, this is a major clinical problem. So when these devices, defibrillators, pacemakers, et cetera, are placed, uh, these patients are given prophylactic antibiotics for about three days uh, in the strong hope that no infection occurs. If it does, then the devices generally have to be removed. And in this particular study, um, an antibacterial envelope was developed, as shown here, the TYRX envelope, and this envelope is uh, impregnated with um, minocycline, and the minocycline is resorbed uh, for about seven days, and the full envelope disappears and is also resorbed in about nine weeks' time. 
So the patients were ra randomized to treatment, uh, large numbers of patients in both groups, 3,500 patients and, uh, that got the envelope and 3,500 that uh, just received prophylactic antibiotics. And you can see that the antibiotic distribution in both groups was similar. And what we see here is that the group that got the envelope had a reduction of their infections by about 40%. Infections weren't all that common anyway, so that the um, um, absolute difference here is about uh, comparing 10% to 6%, uh, but uh, it's a relative difference of 40%. And you can look at these end, uh, endpoints here so that the patients that got the envelope uh, had less problems with having infections and having to get their device removed, etc. So this is a positive trial, and if we look at a whole variety of subgroups that seems to help in all the various subgroups that were inspected here. So the envelope was better. The study has the unfortunate name of RAPID. So RAPID was a randomized control trial looking at this absorbable antibiotic eluding envelope and the antibiotic eluding envelope reduced infections by 40%. That's a relative difference. The absolute difference was about 4%. The next topic involves dabigatron, and the dabigatron is an anticoagulant that, is, uh, has a, that blocks thrombin. So not only uh, does it uh, impair coagulation, but it also impairs uh, platelet activation because platelets can be activated by thrombin. So the hope is that perhaps dabigatron uh, would be helpful in patients that uh, uh, the issue here is stroke. And it turns out about 30% of all ischemic strokes uh, are left with um, no specific explanation why they occurred. No evidence of atrial fibrillation, no evidence of uh, severe atherosclerotic disease in large vessels, and these strokes are termed to be cryptogenic. So what was done here is the patients that had a stroke without known cause were randomized to either aspirin or dabigatron in the hopes that dabigatron might be better in diminishing the chance for a recurrent stroke and the primary safety outcome here was major bleeding. So the study very similar to this was reported earlier in involving anti-10A inhibitor, uh, Arivaroxaban, and in that paper, Arivaroxaban was no better than aspirin, but had more bleeding. So here's dabigatron, same reason. So fairly large numbers of stroke patients here, 2,600 in each group were randomized to either get dabigatron or aspirin in the hopes that dabigatron would be more successful at uh, avoiding recurrent stroke. So if we look at these patients and how their distributed randomization worked okay, two groups look quite similar. Uh, but if we look at the primary outcome in terms of inhibiting the development of further strokes, first of all, first of all additional strokes weren't that common in the first place but there was no evidence that dabigatron was any better than placebo. So the real world is this curve down here. Uh, superficially, it looks like there might be a one to 2% difference in favor of dabigatron and compared to aspirin, but this was not statistically significant. If we look at major bleeding episodes, these are episodes of bleeding that require transfusion or endoscopy or central nervous system bleeding or severe sequelae, that was no different in the two groups. So superficially, they look about the same. However, clinically relevant non-major bleeding was more common with dabigatron. And since dabigatron is substantially more expensive, I think it would be reasonable to treat these patients with aspirin rather than giving them dabigatron. The next topic in the New England Journal is um, fairly complicated, and it concerns this uh, limb and senescent cell antigen-like containing domain protein one. Uh, this is a fairly complicated protein that is involved in integrin function. 
And uh, the issue here is uh, genomic collision. And I'll try to explain that to you. Uh, what was uh, done in this study that I'm going to show you in a minute was uh, a study in patients that received kidney transplantation. And the idea is to find more loci that are involved with rejection. And so something that might possibly be involved with rejection would be if the recipient doesn't have it, but the donor does. And uh, what the investigators did in this study is they looked at a series of SNPs that are associated with deletions. And one of the SNPs, RS893403, is associated with the deletion in this limb and senescent cell antigen-like containing domain protein 1. And um, what we can see here is that the SNP has uh, uh, either homozygous, heterozygous, or homozygous for the other variant. And the expression of, the, uh, of this mRNA is associated with the alleles of this particular SNP. And this particular SNP also has an effect on grip and coiled coil domain containing protein 2, uh, which is uh, uh, serves sort of an adapter function that's uh, involved in cell uh, in protein targeting so that cell uh, proteins are processed properly and excreted properly. So it turns out in this study, uh, we look at uh, different variants of this particular SNP and this uh, uh, limb protein. And what we can see here is that the people that have the AA allele have the complete protein, so they have the protein. People that have the GG allele have this big deletion in this protein. Otherwise, they're symptomatically normal. And people that are heterozygous for this SNP have a deletion of some of the protein. Now, it turns out that uh, this state of affairs is fairly common over the world. And uh, in uh, uh, Far East Asia, the people that live there are primarily AA, so they don't have this deletion. Uh, but people that live in Africa and Europe, etc., and also in North America, commonly have this deletion. And uh, what was done in this study is that the transplant recipients and their donor kidneys uh, were genotyped for this particular state of affairs. And what the investigators did here, this was a, some transplant nephrologists at Columbia University. They looked at 50 SNPs that are associated with deletions. And they found this one uh, that had a bearing on allograft outcome. And uh, they had a positive result here. And in an association study of this nature, what's then necessary is that you have to find replication cohorts. So these replication cohorts were indeed found, and they seem to suggest that uh, indeed this finding was clinically relevant. Now, the idea here is that the recipients don't have a portion of this protein, but the donor kidney has the complete protein. And the recipients recognize this state of affairs and then make antibody against this limb S1 locus protein, uh, which then results in chronic allograft rejection. This is all fairly complicated. So if we look at this, um, this, would, this line represents what would happen if uh, this particular locus had no effect. But we find then, as closer we get to this SNP, uh, a deviation in, in this state of affairs so that this SNP is associated with a highly statistically significant effect on the appearance of allograft rejection. And if we look at that, is that the people that have this uh, risk genotype, AA, uh, they have worse outcomes than the people that have the non-risk genotype, GG. And uh, uh, that's shown here. And this effect on allograft rejection is fairly impressive. So the discovery cohort is shown here, and here's the first replication cohort, and then this is all the cohorts together, and we can see here that the people that have the non-risk genotype 
do better than the people that have the risk genotype. And if we look at whether or not antibody is produced to this um, uh, uh, LIMS1 protein, we can see here that that indeed is the case. And with uh, Western blotting and uh, other techniques, the investigators can show here that people that have the risk allele tend to make antibody against this particular protein that's present in the allograft, but not in them. So this state of affairs is termed genomic collision. And it's a collision between the haves, those are the donors, and the have-nots, those are the recipients that then make antibodies against this LIMS1 protein. Now, whether or not this study indicates that all the patients receiving kidneys should be genotyped for this risk allele so that they're matched with transplant organs uh, that fit uh, is up for grabs and will have to be determined in further studies. The next topic is PI3 kinase. And uh, you'll recall that uh, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors signal via PI3 kinase, complicated uh, state of affairs involving a whole bunch of other proteins and that has an influence in apoptosis and cell proliferation and a bunch of other cellular processes. So PI3 kinase is pivotal. And since variants are uh, mutations and variants occur in certain kinds of cancers, there's interest in developing PI3 kinase inhibitors. And the variant that we're talking about in the study that I'll show you in the moment is called PIK, uh, PI uh, uh, protein uh, uh, phosphoinositol kinase 3CA. And this is the gene that encodes for a protein that's called P110 alpha. And this P110 alpha is involved in signaling and is mutated commonly in certain forms of cancers, including for our study today, breast cancer. So PI3, uh, uh, PIK3CA mutations occur in 40%, that's a lot, of patients with uh, hormone receptor positive um, breast cancers. And um, it, uh, a drug has been developed to inhibit uh, this particular PI3 kinase variant, and this drug is called Alpa, Alpa Lisib. Can't even pronounce it. So this is a drug that inhibits this muta mutations in this protein. So these are patients that had hormone receptor positive, but HER2 negative breast cancers. And uh, they were randomized to receive this inhibitor compared to placebo. And all the patients got uh, fulvastrant therapy in both groups. Now of the patients, about half had mutations in PIK3CA and half did not. And we would think that the patients that have mutations in PIK3CA would do better with this drug than the patients that don't have mutations. And that indeed was the case. So that uh, uh, the cohort that has the mutations in PIK3CA, uh, they do better with this compound than those that get placebo. But if we look at the entire, uh, if we look at the patients that don't have mutations in PIK3CA, then they don't seem to be benefiting from the treatment. And um, uh, so the benefit in the patients that had the mutations was present across the board. But I would point out that the effect of this compound on the uh, results from these patients was less than dramatic, at least in my view. So um, this is a proof of concept studies. Uh, this proof of concept was um, basically not met in the final analysis. And a majority of these patients went on to receive other chemotherapies or hormonal treatments. But in terms of safety, um, that's shown here. And um, Hyperglycemia incurred in some of the patients and nausea and decreased appetite, et cetera. 
So basically, this phase three trial showed a significant prolongation of progression for free survival, but only in the patients that had the mutations. And since the tumors can be screened for these mutations, perhaps some benefits would be present, but the overall effect was somewhat less than overwhelming. The review on the, in the New England Journal is on mucoobstructive lung disease. So when I was a younger physician, chronic lung disease, chronic obstructive lung disease was divided into those with emphysema and those patients with chronic bronchitis. And the patients with chronic bronchitis produced a lot more mucus and slime than the patients that merely had COPD. Well, things have gotten more complicated because of molecular biology. And we now know much more about mucus and its purpose. And we also know the genes that are responsible for the production of mucus and what happens to this mucus after it's produced. And basically the diseases, chronic, uh, these chronic lung diseases that in which mucus production plays a role are COPD, non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, that's here in orange, cystic fibrosis, which is associated with a very stringy, uh, sticky mucus, and then patients with primary ciliary dyskinesia. And in those patients, these cilia don't function properly, so that the mucus isn't continually being moved up, uh, upstream and expectorated. So these cilia disorders, Cartagener syndrome is only one example, but this, these uh, diagnos uh, diagnoses of these things have um, increased exponentially. And then you're familiar with CFTR mutations and uh, chloride transport and how, how that's necessary for mucus production. And here are mucus genes uh, uh, and uh, that uh, produce proteins and their glycosylation is, plays also a role here. And this complicated state of affairs is a function of this review, including uh, the matrix proteins that are involved in mucus and uh, uh, the necessity of uh, adequate amounts of water and uh, how to get all this stuff upstream so that we can cough it out. And the interaction between inflammatory cells and macrophages and an activation of these macrophages and uh, an entire series of events that we now understand in some detail uh, that we didn't know earlier. So if you're involved with this patient, this patient population, and if you're a pulmonologist or if you see patients with lung diseases, very well worthwhile to read this review. I'm afraid the treatment hasn't improved that much in 50 years. Uh, hypertonic saline and mannitol were also used in the 60s to break up uh, sulfhydryl bridges with um, various preparations was also around. These treatments are only marginally successful, but there may be better things on the way. And indeed, for cystic fibrosis, in terms of dealing with cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator function, uh, there have been advances that we've already reviewed recently in the past. Here's an example of a patient that can't breathe through his nose. No idea, never heard of torn wall cysts, but these are apparently benign cystic lesions that are a remnant of the notochord. Uh, this cyst was removed and the patient did better. Then the patient of the week in the New England Journal is a, this is a sad state of affairs. It's a 55 year old man, uh, opioid use disorder. So, uh, and he has hepatitis C infection and they put him in jail for two years. Now, medical care in American prisoner, prisons is not exactly um, uh, a model of success. And these patients uh, probably should all be vaccinated when they come into the door to avoid subsequent problems. And if they have hepatitis C, they probably ought to, receiving, ought to be receiving some modern treatment but of course that was not the case. So this patient is then finally discharged after two years in the prison. And when he's back outside, he engages in his usual behaviors and he shows up with jaundice. 
Now we know that he has hepatitis C virus infection anyway, but if we, he comes into emergency rooms and complains of various things and gets pain medicines and all this sort of stuff, uh, but he uh, ends up having a bilirubin of 1.7 on presentation, that goes up to 21. And as we see here, his liver enzymes are also markedly increased with the exception of his alkaline phosphatase, which really doesn't go up very much. So it looks like he has an inflammatory cause for jaundice. And uh, he's uh, examined with uh, imaging techniques and he doesn't seem to have obstructive jaundice and his pancreatic biliary tract seems to be okay. And his portal vein is open and the blood flow is in the proper direction. So we would think then of inflammatory reasons for jaundice. So could he have ischemic hepatitis? I suppose so, but he wasn't in shock. Pancreatic biliary disease, unlikely because the imaging studies were negative. Drug-induced liver disease, well, that's possible, but buprenorphine and naloxone and other things that he received do this very rarely. Could his hepatitis C virus infection have gotten worse? I suppose that's possible, but his number of copies actually decreased. Then what the discussant uh, talks about is, could he have received a second dose of hepatitis from some other virus? I suppose that's possible. And in prisons and in drug abusers, hepatitis B is common. We've had an, eff an effective vaccine for hepatitis B since the end of the 60s, or in the 70s at least. And it's a pity that these patients aren't rut routinely vaccinated against hepatitis B because this is really unnecessary. Hepatitis A still exists. Then there is this hepatitis Delta virus, which is a particle, but it only plays a role in infection if you can commonly have hepatitis B. Could this be Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegalovirus? That's possible. So this is discussed here. Long story short, indeed, this patient then gets an antibody profile that's consistent with hepatitis B virus infection, and he indeed also has this hepatitis D particle, which is dependent on and exacerbates hepatitis B virus infection. They actually treat this patient with tenofovir and he improves. But all of this could be avoided if he would have been vaccinated against hepatitis B virus when he was imprisoned. Now we move to the Lancet. And the first topic there is hookworm. Now there are two hookworms that concern us. One occurs in the New World, that's Nicator americanus, and the other is the European hookworm or the hookworm that we have everywhere else, and that's Ancelostoma duodenale. Now we get hookworm, uh, the larvae in stool and various things burrow through the soles of the feet. So uh, the, the larvae are then coughed up and the adult worms live in the gastrointestinal tract where they induce iron deficiency anemia. And hookworm used to be the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in the world. And in 1968, I was taught that the treatment for hookworm was shoes and iron. Give the kids shoes so that the hookworm cycle is uh, uh, ameliorated. Uh, because if you treat them once for hookworm, uh, if they don't have shoes, they'll come back with another dose of hookworm the next time you see them. Now, this study was done in Kenya, and uh, the idea here is to treat these youngsters with albendazole, which is a good idea. Presumably, they have shoes, although that really wasn't import reported in this study. So, the question asked here was, should the children receive albendazole through annual school-based treatment, or should there be a biannual community-wide treatment targeting all ages of patients, not just people that go to school? So this study was conducted. Well, you can imagine, here's Kenya, and this is a, one of these cluster trials. So this is a community-wide distribution of the randomization as shown here. 
And here are the patients and number of household members and uh, who's living in the poorest quartile and who owns a bicycle and who has an earthen floor. Better wear shoes if you have an earthen floor uh, or you might get hookworm and uh, various attributes are shown here. Now, what we learned from this study was that the community-based treatment where the people were given albendazole every six months was more effective than giving it once a year in the schools where it only involved people that went to school. I think they should have gotten a, had a group that got shoes and iron. In the next paper, stereotactic ablative radiotherapy for patients that have solitary metastatic cancer. I think this is an important question because up until last 20 years ago, uh, whether or not metastases should be aggressively treated in these patients with solid tumors and metastases wasn't so clear. Uh, but I think this study brings clarity where the uh, patients received stereotactive ablating, ablative uh, radiotherapy instead of just standard care. Uh, so these cancer patients were not very many of them, uh, but these cancer patients were randomized uh, in a two to one fashion to receive standard care or to have their metastases ablated. And it looks like the patients that had their metastases ablated with this technique went, did better than the patients that had merely standard care. So that's the added value of this study. And in the next study, we see a report on the clinical outcomes after ABO incompatible renal transplantation. And this has been a strategy that's been developed, particularly an area where transplantation numbers are not very good, uh, so that you get more patients transplanted. And this used to be an absolute contraindication, but now patients that have ABO mismatches, particularly if we're talking about liver, living donor transplants, can be desensitized and uh, immunosuppressed in a fashion that ABO trans, uh, incompatible transplants are possible. The hypothesis here is uh, do incompatible transplants do worse than compatible transplants? I would think that would be highly likely. Uh, so um, uh, if we look at where these patients came from, the reports are given here. And uh, we're talking about living donor transplantation so, so that the recipients can be um, desensitized uh, prospectively, which wouldn't be possible with cadaveric donor transplants. And indeed, uh, compatible transplants do better than incompatible transplants. But the fact that you can conduct incompatible transplants at all, I think is amazing in and of itself. So that's what this report is about and the results seem fairly consistent worldwide. So uh, the review in The Lancet concerns refractive eye surgery. And uh, this topic has made substantial inroads over the last decades. And uh, we should have a look at this so that we're familiar with, first of all, what are refractive problems, how to get the focal point back on the retina, and what can be done here. Uh, operative treatments that involve the cornea or operative treatments that involve lens replacement. And the eye doctors have done a great job in getting better at this with their new laser tools and various other things that they have available. Uh, and also lens replacements where the lenses can be constructed uh, so that far and near vision uh, are dealt with uh, as if trifocals are built into your eyeballs. So they've done a pretty good job on this. and. Uh, uh, iris identification remains possible because the iris is not perturbed with these various operative techniques. So you can have a look at that. I'm sorry to announce that Sidney Brenner died. And Sidney Brenner was um, a child prodigy uh, that finished school at age 15 and went to medical school. So he got done with that at 19 and no hospital wanted him because he was too young. So instead of just twiddling his thumbs or becoming a rock star. Uh, instead, he got more education uh, 
and uh, got a PhD in basic science and then des decided that he liked that better than medicine. He was a co-discoverer of messenger RNA, but he also developed a remarkable genetic model, uh, Canaribdis elegans, C. elegans, this worm model, which has made a major difference in our study of uh, the genome of simpler organisms, which are very, very relevant to our own genome. And uh, he was a marvelous person, and he died at age 92. The last patient that we're going to deal with is this one. And this is a 41-year-old man who gets a pain in the neck. And um, I had never heard of this disease. This is acute calcific tendonitis of the longus coli muscle. And what's important about this report is that there are much more important causes to have acute neck pain than this disease. So this patient actually ends up being pretty lucky uh, because he gets some non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and does better. It's surprising to me that calcific tendonitis can be an acute problem, but indeed it can, as this report shows, and with modern imaging, uh, we can see these calcifications, and you can look at this report, but this is actually a fairly benign condition, acute calcific tendonitis of the longus coli muscle, and we have to, the differential diagnosis here is more important than the disease, like retropharyngeal abscesses, meningitis, spondylitis, uh, tumors, uh, oropharyngeal problems, and things of this nature, uh, which need to be considered in the differential diagnosis. So if the imaging shows this benign condition, you can reassure the patient, and that's it for this week, at least in English. Thank you. Also das ging ja ziemlich schnell.